Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our program, Securing the Border and the Homeland, a conversation with Homeland Security Committee Chairman Dr. Mark Green. Please welcome Derek Morgan, Executive Vice President of the Heritage Foundation. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. We're very glad to have you all here. Mr. Ambassador, good to see you. Um, we are, have an excellent program in store for you today, so we're going to get right to it. First, I'll introduce our speaker, and then we're going to have a conversation after that as well. Uh, and I want to especially uh, welcome those of you here who are here in person and also our online audience. I know we have um, several hundred uh, people RSVP'd for that as well. So uh, great to be with you all today. I'm very pleased to introduce a great friend of the Heritage Foundation, Chairman Mark Green. Dr. Green was first elected in 2018 to represent the 7th District of Tennessee, which includes uh, parts of Nashville, a very beautiful part of the country. I was just there a few weeks ago. He currently serves as chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee, and he's also a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Thanks to Chairman Green's efforts and hard work in large measure, the House passed a monumental piece of legislation. The Secure the Border Act, also known as HR2, and you know how critical a bill is when it has a number that low, kind of like a license plate in uh, the United Arab Emirates, if you follow that. Uh, and I understand Delaware has the same system too. Uh, these license plates go for a you know, million dollars or more, it's crazy. But HR2, that's prime real estate. Uh, the bill closed loopholes, provided additional enforcement mechanisms to crack down on illegal immigration, and uh, Heritage played a role in, in crafting, helping craft and sign a coalition letter with a lot of policy uh, recommendations, considerations, and analysis uh, for HR2, many of which were adopted in the final legislation. Our sister organization, Heritage Action for America, key voted the bill urging a yes vote, and it passed by a margin of 219 to 213. We're still working to educate our friends in the Senate about this important piece of legislation. The bill is in response to the utter failure of the Biden administration, in particular, uh, the failure of Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas uh, to respond to the ongoing border crisis that we see every day on our TV, and in fact, every community around the country. Speaking of Heritage Action, they release a scorecard which scores each member based off of his or her votes and whether they stay true to the conservative principles. And Congressman Green easily aced our scorecard with a lifetime score of 97%. Pretty impressive. Prior to serving in Congress, he served in the Tennessee State Senate, uh, where then as now he brought his experiences as a businessman and an ER physician. He also served 24 years combined in the military academy, the Army and the Army Reserves. I can commend uh, uh, to, uh, to you uh, a book that he wrote when he was deployed. He was deployed to both uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. His book was called A Night with Saddam. And it details his experiences capturing and interrogating Saddam Hussein. Uh, if you're, you're old enough like me to remember that moment when he was hiding in that uh, spider hole. So uh, we couldn't have been joined by a more qualified member of Congress to talk about the dangers facing our nation, especially those that emanate from our porous border. So I'm excited to hear from Congressman Green today. Uh, with that, please join me in welcoming Chairman Green. Well, it's great to be with you guys today. I'm honored to uh, be here. There's no better place on the planet than to celebrate uh, this great bill being passed and at Heritage. Uh, I recall when I was a young captain infantry officer, I first encountered Heritage and I started reading some of the publications that were put out and I thought, you know, someday it'd be really cool to work with these guys. And uh, what do you know, um, we did. And with the monumental effort that the organization put together in helping us write the bill, we got a great bill and it, uh, something that I personally, my team, and Heritage should be very proud of, a historic bill. Certainly the most conservative border security bill in the history of the country. Before I get started though, I wanna uh, say a few thank yous and then share a little bit of insight about the bill and, and sort of how it all went down, and then we'll take some questions. But um, Laura uh, Rees, you lead an amazing team of people and. 
your assistance was monumental. Um, when I say they helped, Heritage helped, I mean, from the text of the bill to the messaging to the, I mean, everything. Uh, and of course, she had some partners in crime uh, helping her out, uh, Mark Morgan and Tom Homan. Uh, guys, is Tom here? I don't, usually he'd be sitting right next to you if he was here. Um, but, um, you know, wisdom, experience, leadership, friendship, um, throughout this whole process, uh, I can't thank you two enough for being the repository of wisdom and, and, and everything that goes on. And of, of course, the energy that Mark brings to everything that he does uh, ha was very helpful through the process. And you, you never have to ask those guys for help. You know, they're always there uh, with, with a smile and sometimes with the appropriate frustration because the challenges that we confronted with this piece of legislation that we continue to confront holding uh, Secretary Mayorkas and the Biden administration uh, accountable for their failures, for their dereliction of duty, for their dishonesty. Um, it's a continuing fight and it takes resolve. And sometimes that's not a smile on the face. And uh, I appreciate you guys. And I want to give a special thanks too to Mike Howell. Mike, Mike was the guy who got the call late at night. We were, you know, we were literally making the sausage to make this bill. And there were parts of the bill where the New Yorkers who, who sit in a, a Biden district needed help on, on the NGO piece. And we're literally in the markup, 1 a.m. on the phone with Mike saying, what about this? What are your thoughts on this? But will this do what we want it to do? Will it accomplish X? And uh, fantastic assistance in that. We got it worded just right. Everybody was for it. Gonzalez on one side and, of course, uh, the New Yorkers on the other. And it was, it was done. And so thank you, Mike, and thanks to the whole Heritage team. And I, I, I you know, I want to thank the organization as a whole, too, because, again, when I was young and thinking about our nation's political challenges and starting to read about the things that Heritage was advocating for at the time, I realized just how important the organization is to equipping us, equipping us to do our job. It's sort of like the ammunition, the, the fuel in the engine, if you will, and um, it's pretty important. I also have to give another shout out too to one of my staffers who's here, and he doesn't know this is coming, but John, Cooper is uh, somewhere around. And John uh, was instrumental in helping not only write the legislation, but what we're going to talk a little bit about today, the five phases of holding Mayorkas accountable. He is the guy. And the documents that you see coming out of our, our and next week we'll release, uh, I think on Monday, the findings of phase one, the dereliction of duty phase, John has been the guy that has penned that and assembled it with the help of all of our other staff but he's done a fantastic job, John. Appreciate your hard work. Um, you know, we passed a bill. It was a win in a battle in a war that isn't over yet. We have to get this thing through the Senate. We have to encourage the Senate to do the right thing and pass this bill. And we also have to hold this department accountable, this administration accountable. Um, what we're facing right now, and I know most of the people in this room know the stats, but I'm going to run them again. 5.5 million encounters at our southern border. If you add the northern border, we're talking 6.4 million. If you talk about the gotaways, that's 1.5 million gotaways. You know, those are the guys that are intentionally avoiding Customs and Border Protection. Now, if you're immediately paroled into the country after encountering a Customs and Border Protection individual, why would you avoid them if your intent is to just come into the country peacefully. Well, we know better. And consequently, thousands of criminals, murderers, rapists, human traffickers, drug traffickers have been allowed into the United States. No problem. All on the watch of Secretary Mayorkas and President Joe Biden. Um, 
it is, it is a travesty. Uh, it is concerning. In fact, it scares the heck, heck out of us. 240 terrorists, 245 terrorists, people on the terrorist watch list just this year, or just this administration. Think about that. In the entirety of 2017 to 2020, there were 14. When you know that the border's wide open, the people who want to come take all sorts of, you know, character. Uh, those folks who really are looking for economic opportunity, they come, although that's not a legitimate reason to come illegally. But people who want to hurt Americans are wanting, are they're coming across our southern border because it is an open border. And those people on the terrorist watch list have massively increased. Recently, just a few days ago, we realized that Customs and Border Protection had released an individual into the United States on the terrorist watch list who actually was in Tampa, had just been released into the country, and we found out that they were on the terrorist watch list because they tried to buy an airplane ticket in Tampa. I mean, think about who's in that gotaway population if we're catching a few people like this. You all know these statistics too, 107,000 dead Americans to uh, drug overdose. Fentanyl now the number one killer, age 18 to 45. And it's not like people are committing suicide. That's a horrible thing. But these are kids who are at parties who think they're taking an Adderall and it's laced with fentanyl and they, they never wake up. This, this is devastating our country, devastating our youth. And it's all because of an open border. When I talk to the sheriffs in my state, I ask the sheriffs, what was the price of fentanyl, a hit of fentanyl on the street in Tennessee in January of 21? And they said about 95 bucks. So if you wanted a hit of fentanyl, it was $95 on the street. Of course, I ask, well, how, how, what is it today? 28 bucks. It's simple supply demand. There's a supply demand curve for money, for labor, for widgets, and for fentanyl on the street. And it's because this open border has facilitated the drug cartels sending that stuff, the Chinese Communist Party sending that stuff into our country. And we just recently learned after talking to a sector chief that this massive increase in Chinese nationals is something to be deeply concerned about. 12,000 just this year. 12,000 just this year. If you look at the three years prior to this year, there's almost no statistical significance in the difference between those years, and it's flatlined compared to an exponential curve of 12,000. What's going on? Did something happen in China? No. And the sector chief admitted to me that they had known ties, many had known ties to the PLA and the CCP. Well, what does that mean? Well, I can't tell you 100%, but I'm a military guy, I can use my head, use my brain. The Russians, before they went into Ukraine, sent saboteurs into Ukraine. If we go to defend Taiwan, what happens if there's a brigade of saboteurs sitting here that came here from China? We already know they have intelligence services operating in our cities. We already know they have a listening post just off the island of Cuba where they can listen to Southcom, right? Jayadif South, the Joint Interagency Task Force South at Key West. And they had a spy balloon. Interestingly enough, in that week, we had two interesting phenomena that occurred within seven days from one another. The president had his State of the Union address, and a Chinese spy balloon traversed the United States filming 23 military installations, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Now, one of those two phenomenon is full of hot air and a threat to national security. The other one was shot down over the waters of South Carolina. But it's really not a laughing matter. 
thousands of Chinese nationals PLA affiliation in the United States just released. It's absolutely insane and a threat to national security. Um, I am taking a lot longer than I thought I would, so I'm going to skip to to the final part of what I want to say, and then we'll just do some questions. Secretary Mayorkas, we're going to hold him accountable, and we're in a five-phase procedure to do that. Now, there are a lot of people who are out there saying, why aren't y'all impeaching this guy right now? I hear it all the time back home. But you, you, have, to, you have to do it in a methodical way that educates the American people along the way. If you look at what happened with the D.C. crime bill, the Democrats said, no, we're not going to support that. We, of course, felt like D.C.'s willingness to release violent criminals was a bad idea, and the federal government, the Congress, has oversight over D.C., so we said, nope, you're not going to do that. We had a bill. The Dems said we're going to vote no. The Democrats in the House all voted no. Well, the furor of the American people rose as they became aware of what was going on, and the senators who said we'll never vote for that voted for it, leaving the House members who voted no hanging high and dry. And the president, who said he was going to veto it, signed it into law saying, I will not side with the carjackers. All we got to do is educate the American people, have this furor arise, and maybe, just maybe, they'll do the right thing. And hold Mr. Mayorkas and Mr. Biden accountable for this open border, this catch and release that has caused the, the drug cartels to seize the opportunity, develop a strategy that is working where they control our southern border. In our investigation, we're going to show in those five phases that Mr. Mayorkas lied to the United States Congress, has broken at least 10 laws, has refused to obey court orders. And probably the worst thing, and the thing that sits the most heavily with me, is he's disregarded the United States Congress, which is a threat to the very foundation of our government, Separation of powers is the foundation of our government. I interviewed Saddam Hussein on the night of his capture. I asked Saddam Hussein, I said, why did you start the war with Kuwait? And Saddam held up his hand to me in a room 10 feet by 15 feet. And Saddam Hussein says, all of human civilization comes from the Tigris and Euphrates River. Every person on the planet is an Iraqi, and I'm the president of Iraq. And Saddam was essentially saying, he's the king of the world. He can do whatever he wants. How does a person get that way? What's well, that old adage, absolute power corrupts absolutely. If you put power into the hands of fewer and fewer people, in that case, one person, it will turn to tyranny every time. And our founders were brilliant. They said, let's spread power out. Let's separate it amongst three separate branches of government. Montesquieu, right? And then they said, let's break it down between a federal government and a state government. And they spread power out to get one word, freedom. And if Mayorkas is, is completely blowing off the United States Congress, the laws passed by the Congress, the, law, the, the court orders, he is totally disregarding the entire foundation of our government. It's unacceptable. It is unacceptable. And so that's the battle we're in. We're fighting for the very foundation of this republic, which is at risk. And it's not like it's just the Congress that they're picking on. After the student loan ruling from the Supreme Court, what's Joe Biden want to do? Figure out a way to get around the Supreme Court. It's a total disregard for the very foundation of this government, and that is separation of power. So we never get tyranny and we get freedom. That's the battle. And I can't tell you how pleased I am to have Heritage leading that fight. Thank you for the assistance that you give us. We have confidence, we have encouragement knowing that you're there. And thank you for the time to be here today. What a, what a great way to conclude uh, Thanks. your remarks. Uh, such a good clarion call to defend our our nation and our yeah. separation of powers. And thank you uh, for your service in Congress and your service in uniform. Uh, all right, so I wanna dive in a couple things you talked about. Okay. Um, so first is the investigation. What was kind of the impetus for it? What is it that really got it started? 
And then, I mean, you've talked about why it's necessary. We fully agree. Uh, we wrote a pretty long paper. My colleague, uh, Steve Bradbury, who's here, he wrote a, a paper on it as well. Um, but maybe you can just walk us through how you visualize the investigation, where it's going next, and in addition to the phases, you know, dereliction of duty and the cartels and so forth. So what was the start of it? And kind of walk us through the phases in a little more detail, maybe. Well, we knew that the failure at the southern border needed to be investigated. I mean, I have oversight authority. So we want Congress to do its job. Um, we're all sitting here watching what happens mm -hmm. and shaking our heads going, something has to be done. Yeah. So uh, the thought processes started in my brain, how do we do this in a way that educates the American people, doesn't seem as if it's vindictive, but is, um, you know, strategic, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's, it's one thing to have a spine, right, and to stand up, but you also have to have a brain and uh, do it in a way that makes a difference, right? I want to move the needle. I don't want to be a symbol clanging in the back of the room. Mm -hmm. So I just sat down and thought, well, what, how do we do this? And I came up with the five phases uh, myself, and, and, and I carry this. I'm an Army guy, so we always have our little green books, you know, mm -hmm. those of you who are veterans. And so I'm just sitting there pinning in, in my uh, green book, and that came up with those five phases. The five phases are... Dereliction of duty, that's our first one, the one we mm -hmm. just finished. Um, the second one is the facilitation of cartel crime and how an open border is absolutely advancing the criminal activity inside the United States. Mm -hmm. And you can just simply Google San Francisco cartel crime and you can see how the cartels have essentially taken over the criminal activity in San Francisco. It's yeah. fascinating. All because of an open border. All in the hands of uh, Alejandro Mayorkas. Um, phase three will be the human costs. And this is where we will bring in, you know, the moms who've lost children, uh, the dads who've lost a spouse that was struck by a fleeing illegal. Um, mm -hmm. We will bring in the spouse of a Border Patrol agent who committed suicide. Mm -hmm. 17 suicides in the last year in Customs and Border Patrol. Put that into perspective. They have a force of about 17,000, 17 suicides, the highest ever in the history of the organization, by the way. Mm. The New York Police Department has 35,000 members with three suicides. Mm. So the, the, the delta there is, is exponential. Mm. Um, so there's a massive human cost to this. And then the uh, phase four will be the actual financial costs. Mm -hmm. As you think about um, the social services that get expended. You think about the law enforcement costs, but a lot of times people don't think about the, um, you know, uncompensated care in a hospital. If you have 7 million people coming into the United States, they're going to go to the emergency department without health insurance. Well, what do they do in the emergency department if you go and, and you create a bill that never gets paid? Well, they cost shift this is heritage. Mm -hmm. You got somebody here who gets this, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's cost shifted to the insured pay. So all of your health insurance prices go up, yeah. right? So that, that's a cost to an open border. And, and there's a human cost to that too. In, in Yuma, Arizona, the hospital there, the people who live in that community have to drive 200 miles to have their babies wow. because the ward's all full of illegals. Um, and then the last one is we've had some people, uh, they're informants at this point, and I know there are people in the room, Mark will understand what this means. They're not whistleblowers yet uh, because that triggers a special process, but uh, there is potentially some, some fraud going on in the department too. So, Yeah, you know, talking about the cartels, I was just listening to a report this morning about some mansions in Central America with uh, 49er logos on their gates and others would have Denver Broncos or wherever it is that, you know, their kind of territory is uh, it's infuriating. Wow. <laughs> that, you know, they treat our cities like that. Wow. Um, so, all right. So what do you hope your colleagues are going to learn during this process? You've got these five phases. Uh, hopefully both sides of the aisle see and conclude something from the investigation. Um, you know, and, and maybe you could touch on what you found so far and whether uh, that is enough, you think, to compel some bipartisan condemnation 
uh, of the secretary? Well, I think clearly uh, condemnation. I mean, the guy actually admitted that he didn't understand the strategy of the drug cartels to the United States Senate. Mm -hmm. He was under oath and being questioned by senators, and he didn't understand either the strategic or the tactical methodologies of the cartel. Now, if there is a general officer in the United States Army who didn't understand the methodologies of the enemy, we would fire that general on the spot. Mm -hmm. We would never entrust men and women, our sons and daughters, to his care on a battlefield. Yet this guy admits to the United States Senate that he doesn't understand about the colored bands, the tactical methodologies, mm -hmm. and he didn't understand that they were overwhelming the crossing sites, that's their strategic methodology, and then bypassing through when, when CBP gets thinned in the rural lines, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, I, I hope that they recognize his incompetence. I hope they recognize that this has been intentional from the very beginning because every system, whether it's their interim final rule or the CBP-1 app, mm -hmm. everything they're doing is to speed people into the United States to mask what's happening from the American people. That's what CBP-1 app does. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, counts them in a different, uh, it's a shell game on the numbers. Yeah. So uh, I hope they see that it's intentional um, and, and I hope they see the disregard for the laws of the United States. You don't get to pick and choose when you're a cabinet secretary which laws of the United States you're gonna enforce and which ones you're not. So, um, and, and I think there's some laws that Maricus has broken himself, although I'm not prepared to go into detail about that today. And do you think uh, the bipartisan nature of this, are you seeing um, colleagues on the other side of the aisle really wrestling with this yet? Well, initially their argument was that this is just a policy difference, right? Right. I mean, and, and okay, well, your policy is killing Americans. Your policy violates the laws of the United States. That doesn't make it right just because it's different than our policy. <laughs> right. In fact, yes, I agree. We had 89 policies that you canceled that has resulted in this migration crisis, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a policy difference. It's just yours is killing, uh, are killing Americans. Yeah, well said. So what would you say is the top one or two findings uncovered so far that was most shocking to you, most astounding? Well, I'm a military guy, so, you know, the, the 12th, when I looked at the numbers on the Chinese nationals coming into the United yeah. States, I mean, that's a, that's a plan. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's programmed. Yeah. And, and I get the concept of the Boxer Rebellion and the, and the Opium Wars and mm -hmm. China taking some retaliation I mean, that intellectually makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm a student of China's history and um, yeah, I'm a, actually a geek on it. You know, I've, I've read Mencius, I've read Zunzu, I've read mm -hmm. Zunzi, I've read, uh, you know, Confucius, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, I get the imperial nature. There can only be one tiger on, mm -hmm. you know, on the top of the mountain and Sun Tzu and, um, mm -hmm. you know, this whole na Belt and Road uh, of Sun Tzu is, uh, make an ally far away to confront an enemy nearby. And if the United States and the South China Sea is the enemy nearby, why not make friends with, uh, you know, allies throughout the world in order to contend against the United States in the South China Sea? That's just, it's an imperial philosophy from the warring states periods in China. So, I mean, I get their, what they're doing. Uh, we're just aiding and abetting them. Yeah. And, you know, 100 years in U.S. history is a long time. Not so much Not in so the much history in China. of China. No, it's like no. uh, 4,000 years. War feels like yesterday yeah. in some ways. Um, so, uh, well, let's let's continue on the Chinese subject for a minute. Um, so you've you talked in some detail. You just uh, outlined it here. You broke some news uh, last month when you announced that official sources had said that some of the individuals had ties to the CCP and to the People's Liberation Army. Uh, so can you talk a little bit more about that particular revelation? and um, just how big a threat it is to have this porous border with respect to China? Well, there's not much more that I can say in a, in a setting like this, okay. um, but what I will say is uh, it is, the numbers are up to 12,000, mm -hmm. um, which is a massive, massive increase over previous years. They're known ties to the PLA, uh, and they're you know, military age men just being released into the United States. Mm. paroled right away just like you know, all you have to do claim asylum and you're you're in yeah 
So, um, and the cartels actually, that they charge a fee too of, for the Chinese they bring in. It's 50 grand for the Chinese mm -hmm. to come in, 50 grand from Iran. You know, if you're in Guatemala, Mr. Ambassador, it's a little cheaper. Uh, the distance, you know, I think, I guess, but, um, you know, so it's, yeah, it's, it's just terrible. Um, I have to give some credit to that sector chief, though, who boldly, um, you know, told us about that. Yeah. Because, um, let's face it, this, this administration has not been very nice to whistleblowers. Look at the DOJ and what's happened over there yeah. to those whistleblowers. People just telling the truth of what's going on in our government, and they're getting targeted. Mm -hmm. And so this individual came to us with the details and um, very, uh, very strong and, and courageous thing to do. Yeah, it yeah. is. And there's a lot of brave people in the Border Patrol, and oh, they're they all want, they want to do their jobs. They yeah. they want to, um, and they're just not let not letting them do it. You touched on the one app uh, program and you called a shell game, which I think is exactly what it is. We talked about that a lot at Heritage as well because they're just trying to make the numbers look better. It's yeah. so cynical and uh, frustrating. Can you just explain to someone who's hearing this for the first time, you know, what is this all about? There's this app on a phone. Why should I be concerned about this? So the CBP-1 app was originally designed to facilitate commerce between Mexico and the United States. When you had to bring an 18-wheeler full of stuff through customs, you programmed an appointment, basically, through the CBP-1 app. What Mayorkas has done is turned that into a mechanism for people to apply for asylum. Mm -hmm. So the person basically fills that in, and they show up at a port of entry, and they get counted in a different number. And originally, they were going to do 1,250 appointments a day. Uh, and so these, you know, and, and of course, as soon as they announced it, we knew what was going to happen. For the, the cartels, you know, for an added fee, we'll fill out your CBP-1 app for you, right? Um, but anyway, we've discovered that that's exactly what's happening. Uh, but now they've increased it to 1,450 a day. And of course, if someone shows up, out, outside the border, let's say they go to a, between a port of entry, mm -hmm. what's, what the Customs and Border Patrol guys are telling them now is to, if you'll go back into Mexico and then go to a port of entry and fill out the app, you'll just get brought in. And it's an automatic mass parole system. Yeah. So if you fill it out, you, you, they don't, and they've taken away, the, there's typically two, question, two processes and Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's two steps, you know, and there's, a, there's the Border Patrol step and then there's the judicial step that are in that asylum process. And they basically have done away with the second step, mm -hmm. contrary to the laws of the United States, okay? So that, it's an, basically an automatic parole if you fill out the app, and by the way, you get the numbers counted differently, and if you come to Border Patrol and you turn around and go to the, you know, it's all counted differently. Mm -hmm. So it's a shell game to hide the numbers. And so, yeah. And if you claim that asylum could be your court date could be many, many months or years in the advance, and you know, down the road. I think 600,000 or so didn't even get a court date so far. There you go. According to this administration. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Okay, well, we've got Mayorkas' enforcement priorities memo too. I wonder if you could touch on that. The Supreme Court has ruled that states didn't have standing to uh, enjoin that. So I guess that puts even more onus on Congress uh, to push back, um, you know, perhaps by uh, defunding or using another appropriations tool. So can you talk to us about how you're thinking about that issue? Yes, we're actually looking at a, a several different courses of action now that the states were deemed to not have standing. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you read the opinions on that case, there is nowhere in there where they say what Mayorkas is doing is right, Yeah. okay? Uh, and I think it was Kavanaugh who made some very uh, damning comments about what's going on, but it came down to who, who has standing to bring the case. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking to see where our legal standing is in that regard. We're also looking uh, at, you know, at defunding some positions. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's something that we're considering. Mm -hmm. uh, good, and there's other things you can do too. You can go after 
salaries and whatnot. That, that, that's what I mean. Things. When I say defunding, <laughs> I say defunding positions. Lots of fun can be had there. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned NGOs as well, and we've done a fair bit. You, you uh, noted uh, Mike Howell's work, which he's done great work on. He had uh, he and the team put together a, um, uh, a study of cell phone data from NGOs and showed it how uh, folks go to these centers and then are spread out through the entire country, uh, really bringing visual evidence to the point that we say all the time, which is every community is a border community now. Uh, and so, uh, you know, your, your committee passed out uh, a, a piece of this in HR2 that really restricted DHS's ability, uh, you know, to fund these NGOs. And so a lot of people though are gonna think these are do-gooder organizations and uh, take on face value their claim that they're just trying, you know, to help people, uh, and they don't understand that they're these NGOs are actually, you know, facilitating uh, and really exacerbating the crisis in some ways. So I wonder if you could just give her a, a better picture of that for someone who who hasn't focused on this up to this point. How how are they operating with DHS in a way to exacerbate this crisis? So the the NGOs obviously facilitate sort of the process, right? So they make the process easier, easier mm -hmm. smoother, et cetera. And if you make the process easier, smoother, and better, faster, efficient, um, it, it's an incentive. It mm -hmm. adds to the incentive at least. Mm -hmm. um, and what you want is a disincentive. That's why the law was written that you have to detain, mm -hmm. right, in the process. And Mayorkas is not detained, even though he very dishonestly said, oh, we don't have the resources, mm -hmm. and we're overwhelmed. Meanwhile, he's asking for less ice beds and yeah. filling a lot less ice beds. So that, that's dishonest, mm -hmm. okay? But so the, the NGOs come in, and in fact, they even are getting contracts to house people. And we've now discovered that, again, contrary to the law, it's very clear that the asylum seeker must pay for their legal expenses on their own. That is in the law. Mm -hmm. Taxpayer dollars going to an NGO and the NGO providing legal services is U.S. Mm -hmm. taxpayer dollars funding exactly what the law says shouldn't happen. Yeah. So that, that is another of the uh, laws of the United States just being totally disregarded by this, uh, this administration. So mm -hmm. what we wanted to do was to clip the wings. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, that's when we had the bill. It was very comprehensive. At, at the, the language was very comprehensive at the time. The New Yorkers were, hey, if you, if you do this, it's going to have a trickle-down effect on other NGOs that are in our district. And so that's when we had Mike on the phone and pounded out a definition that actually did exactly what we wanted it to do mm -hmm. without harming the, the NGOs that are really doing good stuff. There are, you know... <clears throat> So many of these NGOs are, are doing great things. So across the country, we do not want an impact on them. Mm -hmm. um, and Mike helped out, made it, helped us get it done. That's uh, to your point of, of working smarter and uh, taking a legitimate concern and, and working with people to, to fix the problem. That's yeah. how it's supposed to be done. Yeah, yeah. that's right. You, you know, nobody has, if, you, if you're ever at the point in life, and I see a lot of young faces in the room, mm -hmm where you think you're the only one that's got the idea, you're in trouble. Um, if I've learned anything in my days running military units and uh, running a big healthcare company and, and all that, it's you want as many ideas as you can get mm -hmm. from trusted sources. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what heritage is for us. Oh, thank you for saying that. All right, so the movie The Sound of Freedom has taken the country by storm. We were fortunate to have a, a viewing in this very room. Oh, cool. And uh, it's, it's about a former DHS uh, agent who rescues a child, uh, sex trafficking victims. And it's doing really well in the theaters. I think it yeah. beat Indiana no, Jones. Yeah, one beat weekend. Indiana Jones, beat Disney. Yeah, that's right. On, on last weekend. That's right. And, um, you know, the administration's policies are making the problem so much worse with, uh, with their policies. Uh, and I think we have a record number of unaccompanied uh, children at the border now. So uh, Senator, uh, Secretary Mayorkas has said he's not gonna turn them back. And uh, I looked at data the other day that said that there's 85,000 that they've lost track of. Um, so what can Congress do? I mean, obviously Mayorkas should be doing his job, should be letting the people that work for him do their jobs. 
what can Congress do at this point to help fix this problem? Well, if you haven't seen the movie, you should see it. Every American should see it, and it's not easy to watch. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. I had, uh, had a phone conversation with, um, I'm on foreign affairs, so we're, uh, I'm talking to some leaders in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. uh, this was two weeks ago. And I'm speaking to a guy named Mohammed. And then Jim Caviezel comes into my office later, later in the day with Tim Ballard. And of course, Jim Caviezel starred as Jesus Christ in um, you know, The Passion of the Christ. And so when they, when they were leaving, I thought, wow, I've talked to Mohammed <laughs> and Jesus in the same day. <laughs> um, but Caviezel, uh, Tim, came, Tim Ballard came into the office and uh, you know, he's going to be on a witness stand at some point mm -hmm. uh, talking about how Mayorkas' open border has facilitated human trafficking of children yeah. into our country. And we're going to let the movie sit out there and percolate a little bit. Mm. And then we're going to bring Tim in, and it'll be um, when we get into the human costs of all this. But um, there's lots of things. Well, let me talk about the 85,000, because yeah. that's the, that disturbing. information came not from Fox News, not from Washington Post, not from the Washington Times. It came from the New York Times not known for its conservative bias. Um, so the New York Times went in and kind of heard about this. They found someone. And uh, turns out this sponsor had like 20-something kids that they had taken on, and they were basically using them for cheap labor, mm -hmm. slave labor. Um, um, unbelievable that that's happening in the United States of America, but it is. And we can only imagine what some other purposes those 85,000 children have found themselves mm -hmm. satisfying. Um, it's, just, it's just unbelievable. And when confronted about it, America just sloughs it off. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we can pass some laws. Uh, we have intentions of passing some laws to, to try to address this issue. It's not an easy one to address because it crosses jurisdictional boundaries because as you know, once they come, they become refugees, and they wind up in the Office of Refugee Resettlement, and it's now they're in HHS's control and not, mm. not homelands. So we've got to sit down with ENC, Committee Health and Human Services, and try to get uh, some resolution for this. I had some legislation last cycle that would change the laws a little bit, that would make the classification of these kids stay with uh, DHS, yeah. which would uh, help fix the problem but only if you have someone at DHS that follows the law. And right now we don't. So um, that's part of the problem. Yeah, I mean, when you think of the, the human carnage at the border, because it's porous with the sex trafficking, with the Border Patrol agents who are taking their lives, it's, uh, it's astounding. It really is unbelievable. Uh, we very much appreciate all of your work on that, and uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you if you if you would indulge us to just tell us a little bit about a little more about the Saddam Hussein uh, sure. interrogation and uh, and capture, and uh, maybe also if you wouldn't mind, we have a lot of our interns here. Maybe give them a piece of advice as they're starting off their working career yeah. uh, as well. Well, I you know Saddam was uh, we were chasing him all around the. The, the country of Iraq for nine months or so. Mm -hmm. And um, when we finally got him, um, you know, it, if you can just imagine what it's like to win a Super Bowl championship, right? That, but then you think, well, that happens every year. Every year a team wins a Super Bowl. But in history, we never caught Pol Pot. We never caught Hitler. We never caught Stalin. We never caught Mao and took these people to justice. Mm -hmm. But I got to be a part of the team that captured Saddam Hussein and, yeah. and then uh, McCraven uh, was in with him and I was standing outside the room with him. Uh, just I just went over to get a glimpse at him. I didn't do that medical exam that was shown on CNN. Mm -hmm. That was another physician. Mm -hmm. um, I, was the guy, I was the target physician, so I went with the shooters to the target. My job was to, to take our wounded guys off. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I came back from the mission and like, I, I'm going over there. I'll regret this the rest of my life if I don't go get a glimpse at the guy. So I go into the interrogation facility and I'm standing outside the room. McCraven comes out and the other doc's gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, McCraven goes, hey, Mark, will you spend 
the first night with this guy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, heck yeah. <laughs> so, so I grab a Stars and Stripes, go into the room, and, and Saddam is laying on the cot. And uh, I just think I'm going to sit there and do nothing for the night. And Saddam sits up and motions me over to take his blood pressure because I had that telltale sign around my neck, the stethoscope. <laughs> and uh, he says, so I took, I took his blood pressure. Um, and as I'm doing that, you know, you're in someone's face when you're right there oh, and yeah. taking a blood pressure. And Saddam says to me, you know, when I was a, a, a young kid, I wanted to be a doctor, but politics had too great a hold on my heart. And when I give speeches about this, I often say, well, I was a doctor and now I'm a politician. Hopefully that's all that rubbed off that <laughs> night. But uh, no, it was, it was fascinating. Um, in terms of advice, read, read. Um, it, if you read, you get to learn before you make the mistake. And if I were encouraging you to read any book other than the Bible, I'd encourage you to read 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell. It is the best book I ever read uh, other than the Bible. And I've read many, many books by John Maxwell since on how to lead, love, and serve people who are working with you. It's all about people read. Well said. And let me just say, we are so grateful for your leadership on the committee and in the Congress at large. Uh, thank you for getting this bill across the finish line. And we look forward to continuing the fight with you. And uh, let's please give a warm, a warm thank you to Dr. Green. <laughs> Great job. It's really fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. A Russian man claiming to hold top-level secrets about Russian advanced bombers has just turned up at the U.S. southern border, seeking asylum. The man claims to have been an engineer at a production facility over in the city of Kazan, and he says that he possesses top-secret information about the White Swan Tu-160, which is the most advanced bomber in the Russian arsenal. U.S. border officials, they interviewed the man, and they determined that his story was in fact credible and eventually passed him off to the FBI, who are still in the process of interrogating him right now. However, analysts have pointed out that the fact that the story was even leaked to the public is an indication that perhaps the American government is encouraging other Russians who also hold top-level secrets to also escape to America. And if you thought that was interesting, well then you should click on that button below this video and check out Epic TV, one of the best no-censorship video platforms